we talked earlier about the value of biodiversity to humans and so we can see that some of the consequences of extinction will be the loss uh, of some of these values that we discussed earlier um, and so for example some biological resources are, are harvested directly that's one value we actually didn't talk about earlier but things like lumber and fuel um, fish uh, from the ocean including sh shellfish um, algae interestingly is harvested uh, to make this compound referred to as gelatin that's used in, in all sorts of uh, things to not only uh, the jello sorts of uh, foods but also things like ice cream to maintain the consistency um, of ice cream and so all these things are resources that would be lost uh, if the organisms that produce them are lost um, we talked pretty extensively earlier about how organisms provide uh, medicines uh, in some cases and so we won't go back and discuss that again wild species also have alleles genes that are not present in domesticated species um, interestingly a lot of uh, genetic engineering today the production of those genetically modified organisms uh, it focuses on taking genes that are found in one species that's often a wild organism and placing that into, into a, a domestic uh, plant typically a plant possibly an animal although I'm not aware of any applications there um, which can increase the the growth rate and the hardiness of that um, food producing plant. Um, wild species also contribute um, things like biological control. Um, they keep pest species in check uh, for, for no cost. And so um, we can think about different examples of uh, biological control. One of the most common um, and simple that would apply here in Central Kentucky uh, would be the consumption of mosquito larvae by all types of fish, but especially these little fish referred to as mosquito fish. You may have seen at some point in your life little minnows swimming along the top of a pond or a stream, typically right along the bank. Now, they're different than most minnows um, because they, they are a type of top minnow. They, they do reside right at the top of the water and typically swim very slowly, sometimes just sitting there hesitating, uh, motionless, right at the top of the water. And so they eat, they're called mosquito fish because they eat primarily mosquito larvae. I suppose we all realize that mosquitoes have an aquatic um, larval stage to their life cycle. So they have to have water in which to reproduce or you don't have mosquitoes. Um, that's why mosquitoes are, are more common in areas where you do have standing pools of water. Um, and so a simple method of biological control then is the fact that these little fish, mosquito fish and others, eat um, the larvae of mosquitoes. Um, and uh, so reduce the number of mosquitoes that are present uh, and it makes it a huge difference I mean you you have a terrible mosquito problem if you do have little standing pools of water without fish to consume those mosquitoes uh, in the larval stage uh, and then you just don't to, you, you don't have any mosquitoes if there's no place for the mosquitoes to breed uh, and so that's a simple method of biological control if you lose those little mosquito fish then you have lots of mosquitoes because there's nothing there to eat them Alright, and so interestingly, when we look at the biological uh, world in terms of, of ecology, we see these things that are referred to as food webs. Um, food webs are uh, the um, flow, the, the, it's a method of tracking the flow of energy through an ecosystem. And so if we look at the food web that we have on our screen, we see, um, excuse me, we see for instance, down at the bottom level of the food web, we see things like phytoplankton. Um, phytoplankton are the producers of this particular food web. Um, they're, they're like the grass um, that's found in terrestrial food webs. They are a photosynthetic, a collection of single-celled photosynthetic organisms that are eaten in terms by lots of things. And so you can see that the phytoplankton are eaten by zooplankton. Zooplankton are slightly bigger animal-like plankton. Uh, phytoplankton are also eaten by krill, little tiny uh, shrimp-like organisms. Um, the zooplankton are eaten by things like squid and fish, which in turn are eaten by penguins, which in turn are eaten by leopard seals, which in turn are eaten by things like uh, killer whales and sperm whales. And so that's the uh, food web. And, and so food webs are, are interesting. They're unique uh, to a particular ecosystem. And they represent a number of interdependent relationships between organisms. And so 
the, what we're talking about here is the consequence of, of extinction. And so if you pull out one of these components of the um, food web, then it's likely that that whole portion of the food web collapses. And, and so if you pull out penguins, then suddenly you don't have anything to eat the fish uh, below them, and the sperm whales or the killer whales above them have nothing to eat. Um, and so each component of an ecosystem is extremely important. And sometimes removing one, even if, even if you don't care as a human about that link specifically, because it has no value to you, sometimes removing that link can affect other links of the food web, some of which may be extremely valuable um, to humans. We want to talk about some interactions between organisms in these uh, food webs, and sometimes just in uh, an ecological sense, not just uh, in the sense that one organism eats another. And so we want to talk briefly about mutualistic relationships here. A mutualistic relationship, as you may realize, is a relationship in which two species benefit uh, from their interaction. And so in the natural world, we see lots of interesting examples of mutualistic relationships, one of which is a um, relationship between a small fish and a larger fish that we see depicted on our slide here in the upper right hand uh, picture. And so we have a large uh, grouper and then we have a very small what we refer to as a cleaner fish in the mouth of that grouper. And so fascinatingly these cleaner fish make their living by pulling parasites off the larger fish. And so it's a mutualistic relationship and both parties benefit because the cleaner fish get something to eat and the larger fish get the, those parasites removed. Um, so, so in areas where there are coral reefs, these large fish will congregate in certain areas where the cleaner fish reside, and those cleaner fish will make their way over each of these larger fish, removing parasites and, and consuming those parasites. And so, of course, the larger fish could very easily swallow the cleaner fish, and, and it does eat fish of that size, but this relationship apparently has developed uh, in a manner, since both parties benefit, then that uh, small fish is not eaten by the larger fish. We also see a uh, mutualistic relationship in the form of ants and acacia trees. Um, so an acacia tree is a tree found in the plains of Africa <clears throat> and interestingly acacia trees have these large thorns that allow ants to uh, hollow out uh, and move inside and live. <clears throat> not only that, but the thorns have a sugary substance inside that the ants consume. And so the ants get a place to live and they get food from the acacia tree. And so you may ask, well, what can an ant possibly provide an acacia tree? But the answer is protection. If a giraffe comes along and starts to eat the acacia tree, then the ants swarm out of these little thorns onto the giraffe biting. They're fairly large ants with a powerful bite and, and uh, harming the, the giraffe greatly. And so the giraffe flees. And so animals simply don't bother the acacia trees because they realize that the ants are present there and will attack them if they touch that acacia tree. Um, bees are another mutualistic relationship and so interestingly although it's not something we typically think about the food that we eat whether we're growing our own garden which we might be doing this time of year or whether we are consuming crops grown by a farmer all of that food comes to be as a result of the pollination of bees and so we talked about the plant life cycle in earlier chapters of our class and we realize that a bee goes from one plant to the next spreading pollen which is the, contains the sperm of the plant and that has to be done in order for an ear of corn uh, to grow on a corn plant or for a tomato to develop or for a watermelon uh, to be produced. Any type of fruit comes about or vegetable comes about as a result of this pollination process and so if it wasn't done for free by bees then someone would have to be out there with a little tiny little artistic paintbrush I suppose and they would brush one flower go to the next and they would deposit that pollen on the next flower which would take weeks and weeks of, with lots and lots of people working but bees do it for free and so interestingly that's a mutualistic relationship now we take advantage of that it's actually a mutualistic relationship between the plants and the, the bees the plants get pollinated and the bees get something to eat they get that nectar uh, but we do take advantage of that because we like to grow uh, plants for food. Um, and so there's been some concern recently uh, as a re result of the fact that uh, bees in certain parts of the country have become less common um, as a result of, of disease and the introduction of, of exotic uh, bees are two causes uh, for this.
But if bees um, go extinct, then, then humans would lose out to a large extent because that mutualistic relationship would no longer exist and something would have to uh, take its place. All right, so we talked earlier about biological control, uh, methods by which organisms in the environment control pests. And so, um, interestingly, here we, ha we have an example of that. And so we have, uh, we know that a predator is, is an organism that consumes uh, other species. And so I mentioned songbirds earlier in our lecture today as well when we were talking about ecological diversity. But uh, we said at that point that songbirds consume insects. Um, and so songbirds are an interesting group of birds. They're very small birds um, that you see probably on almost a daily basis. Um, and so uh, finches, um, for example, would be a type of songbird. And uh, these are birds that, that migrate. Um, sparrows are, are not considered songbirds. English sparrows, if you're familiar with them, are, are residents of uh, Kentucky and other states in the southeast. But, but songbirds actually migrate to South America during part of the year and then come back uh, during the summer to North America. And songbirds consume insects. And, and so as long as the songbirds are there to consume um, insects, then the insects are, are not able to obtain uh, very high numbers and to do things like damage forests as we see here in the picture. Um, these evergreen trees are being damaged by uh, a particular type of insects, most like insect, most likely a gypsy moth primarily. And as long as the birds are there to eat the insects, no damage occurs. But songbirds have been in trouble recently for a number of different reasons. Uh, in South America, their habitat's being destroyed. Um, and to some extent that's true in North America. Interestingly, cats uh, that people let loose, um, let, let allow to run out, to uh, remain outside are, are very hard on songbirds uh, in North America. And as uh, songbirds decline, then they're not there to eat those insects, and so the forests in some cases have a harder time as a result of the proliferation of those insects. An idea related to this is the idea of competitive exclusion, and so interestingly Competitive exclusion is this idea that no two organisms can occupy the exact same niche. Um, and so a niche, as I think you'll remember from earlier in our class, is where an organism lives and what it does. N-I-C-H-E, a niche. Um, so each organism in the environment has a niche. We talked about birds earlier. We said that the niche of a vulture is to fly around way up in the air, look for dead things, and swoop down and feed on those when it finds them. The niche of a hummingbird is to to drink nectar from flowers and buzzing around constantly at, uh, in a very rapid manner. And so two organisms can occupy the same niche. Um, if they compete in the same niche, one will win and one will lose. We can sometimes take advantage of this in the following manner. So we realize that, that uh, Salmonella is a uh, bacteria that's harmful um, to uh, humans and oftentimes we're exposed to salmonella via the meat of chickens. And so when chickens are, are being processed, um, they're, this may be a little unpleasant, but their insides are removed, and sometimes some of the uh, bacteria from their insides, their digestive tract in particular, gets on the meat. If you don't cook the meat thoroughly, then you can get very sick as a result of that. And so if there's less salmonella or no salmonella in the chicken digestive tract to begin with, then you're much better off. So one idea to lower the levels of salmonella in the chicken uh, digestive tract is to intentionally infect them with a bacteria uh, that's harmless. And so on the screen we have this harm, we have one chicken and the groups of chickens are treated in, in two different ways. In part A, the chicken is not fed any of the beneficial bacteria. So there's no bacteria present in the chicken's digestive tract. Salmonella colonizes the chicken's digestive tract. It doesn't hurt the chicken, uh, but it will eventually uh, hurt uh, humans in the, in the manner that we just described if chicken is not cooked uh, sufficiently. So here we have the uh, number of bacteria on the y-axis. Here's hatching. Um, they're exposed to salmonella, and so salmonella bacteria, sorry about that, colonize the digestive tract. Here we have a group of chickens that are exposed to a beneficial uh, bacteria early in life. And so they're exposed to that beneficial bacteria at uh, right after they hatch. We have number of bacteria on the y-axis. So those bacteria proliferate in the digestive tract. 
And now, later in life, when the chickens are exposed to salmonella, the salmonella, now they are present to some extent, but they're present at what would you say four times a level that's only 25% uh, what the level of the salmonella would be if the chickens had not been exposed to the beneficial bacteria. So this is an example of competitive exclusion. We expose the chickens to a beneficial bacteria harmless to humans. That bacteria proliferates and then when the chickens are exposed to harmful bacteria, that harmful bacteria doesn't have much of a niche to occupy and so very few of those harmful bacteria uh, are able to survive. Um, interestingly, this is taking place in your own intestine as well. Perhaps a little unpleasant to think about, but there are har beneficial bacteria there that are preventing harmful bacteria from proliferating and obtaining high numbers in your digestive tract. We also want to talk briefly about energy flow. Um, as we discuss <coughs> the different impacts of extinction on the ecosystem. And so energy flow occurs in an ecosystem when, as you undoubtedly realize, uh, photosynthetic organisms like grass in this terrestrial ecosystem um, take energy and turn it into chemical forms that animals can use. Now what you'll notice is very interesting that as we go to the next level of this food chain we start out with the producers in the first level and then as we go to the primary consumers we call them the deer primary consumers because they are feeding on the producers the grass look at the energy that, that is present in the second level of the food chain uh, versus the first so this green box represents the energy in the first level of the food chain and only about 10 percent of that makes it up to that second level of the food chain in the primary producers and then only about 10 percent of that energy is transferred on up to the secondary consumers a mountain lion in this case which is eating the deer and so this has a couple of different impacts on the structure of food chains and you realize food webs are combinations of food chains but we'll talk about a food chain here since we're simplifying things for one thing food chains can't be very long uh, because it takes a tremendous amount of grass and deer to support just a single mountain lion and so you can imagine if you put another layer on top of that then that would be another 10 percent reduction and there would be very 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 little energy left uh, at the top of that food chain. And so uh, as we lose biodiversity, if we lose a link in this food chain, if we lose deer for instance, then the ecosystem is just grinds to a halt as a result of the fact that there's nothing to convert that energy in grass up to that secondary consumer. Now in a food web, we need to realize that there's some, there are more pathways for energy to flow through as it goes up the food chain. And so it's likely if deer were gone, the mountain lions wouldn't die instantly. Um, there would be other organisms that would take their place, but it would likely cause a dramatic shift and have a dramatic impact on those food chains and the transfer of energy. We also want to talk briefly about nutrient cycling at this point. Um, we also we want to make the point that energy flows through an ecosystem, as we just pointed out on the previous slide, but nutrients cycle. Um, energy makes this one-way trip. It comes from the sun, it goes to the primary uh, producers, which is the grass, the primary consumer, which is the deer, the mountain lion is the secondary consumer, and then the energy is gone. But that's not true of nutrients at all. <clears throat> and so take things like nitrogen. Here's our nitrogen cycle. The uh, nitrogen uh, starts out in the atmosphere. We'll talk a little bit more about the nitrogen cycle in our next chapter, but as an example of a nutrient, we'll discuss it briefly here. It, go, it goes into the soil and is converted into a usable form. It's taken up into to the plants, uh, and from the plants it goes to an animal like a deer. From the deer it goes to an uh, animal like this cougar or mountain lion. When these animals die, the nitrogen goes back into the soil <clears throat> and is reused. And so, inter interestingly, nutrients cycle um, through an food for, through a, an ecosystem, through a food web, um, and, and then through the the non-living parts of the ecosystem as well. Um, but energy flows, and so if we modify any part of this ecosystem, then it's very likely that we'll modify the transfer of these nutrients from one level to a next. 
to the next. So for instance, uh, in nor the northeastern U.S., we've had the introduction of non-native uh, earthworms, and interestingly that's changed the soil community and had a very dramatic impact on the cycling of these nutrients, such as nitrogen, through the ecosystem. And so here we're not even losing an organism at all, <clears throat> we're simply adding a non-native organism that's not supposed to be there, and therefore altering the number of native organisms, and so we have an impact just that has an impact on the, the cycling of nutrients through that ecosystem. Uh, as we close our chapter then, we want to mention this. So how do we preserve uh, biodiversity? And, and we want to mention that biodiversity is not distributed uniformly across the face of the earth, um, but less than 2% of the earth's surface contains about half of the number of mammals, birds, reptiles, and plants that are present on the earth. And so these areas are, are biodiversity hotspots. There's also a high degree of endemism of endemic organisms found in these areas. Oftentimes, this, oftentimes these areas are, are in tropical sort of areas. If you look across the, the globe here, many, many but not all of these uh, environments are in uh, areas that, that would be tropical rainforest. Um, certainly the coast of California uh, is, is an exception. Um, Southwest Australia there are exceptions, but for to a large extent, um, many of these are tropical rainforests, which tend to support incredibly high biodiversity. We also want to mention uh, at this point that a, a large uh, population and a fat, quickly growing population provides a lot of protection against uh, extinction for for an organism. So. For instance, on the screen we see two different um, organisms. We see the Lost River Sucker. The Lost River Sucker is a fish that uh, gets pretty big, two feet long or so, uh, lives in the bottom of streams, eating insects. And uh, it, it's had some trouble in the western U.S., especially related to water flow and the withdrawal of water for human use. But what we see is that um, here is, if we start out, if let's say that the Lost River Sucker, these are hypothetical situations. Uh, based on how long it takes this sucker to reproduce. But if we knock the population all the way down to here the, and then let it recover, then the population would recover pretty quickly. On the other hand, the condor, which has to be very old before it reproduces and produces very few young, if we knock the population all the way down to here, it would take a long time to reproduce. And so interestingly, we call this biotic potential. The biotic potential is the potential an organism has to produce offspring, which varies widely. So we could have something like a, an elephant that produces one offspring uh, every maybe two to four years once it's an adult. Um, or we have uh, something like a carp in, in the, the wild. And so a carp may produce a million offspring in, in just a given year. So the carp has a tremendously higher biotic potential and therefore is at much less risk when we talk about environmental uh, disturbances. We also want to mention as we close here that genetics has a big influence on extinctions and on allowing organisms to remain, populations to remain in a healthy state. So there's something that we've referred to in ecology as the point of no return uh, that an organism can reach genetically if the population gets small enough. And so what tends to happen is this. A small population becomes inbred um, and it loses alleles as a result of genetic drift. Remember, genetic drift are just random factors that lead to a reduction in genetic diversity, a volcanic eruption, a, a tsunami, uh, an avalanche. All these things could be factors that lead to genetic drift and, and the loss of alleles from a population. And so you have loss of genetic variability as a result of these reasons that we just mentioned. And then the fitness of the population and the ability of the population to adapt is reduced. You have mortality and low reproduction as a result of that, and then you end up with an even smaller population. And so you end up in this downward spiral that eventually results in the extinction of that organism. This is a very uh, interesting and very demonstrable phenomenon in the natural world. Um, it's especially, uh, it's especially, um, prominent in a, it's been a, demonstrated very conclusively in a population of wolves uh, found in Canada. And so for years, this population of wolves existed in a state 
in which they had a very small uh, number of wolves in the population. A few hundred wolves were present in the population. Then, and of course no one saw these wolves come in, but they have done genetic uh, tests that, that indicate this was the case. Then just a couple of wolves migrated um, from southern, from northern uh, North America into Canada and infused some, some genetics uh, into these, some genes into these wolves and reduced the inbreeding of these wolves. And so the population at that point went from <clears throat> several hundred to several thousand over a very short period of time. There's something we refer to as inbreeding depression that we see on our screen here. And these wolves, before the arrival of the outsiders, suffered from inbreeding depression. This means that the they're more like the adults are more likely to get sick, the young are less likely to survive, um, and that that's a, a very demonstrable um, phenomenon that we observe in the natural world. Um, and so, interestingly, the um, inbreeding depression is the problem with this inbreeding depression is a result of the expression of harmful mutant alleles. As you may already realize, or, or perhaps that you, you don't at this point. I'm going to skip around for just a moment. The real problem with inbreeding is this. When two recessive alleles uh, show up together, then, of course, they're expressed. As it turns out, oftentimes harmful uh, genetic disorders are recessive oftentimes, but not always recessive disorders. You know of cystic fibrosis and sickle cell anemia from our previous discussions in this class. Well, oftentimes in the animal world we have similar situations where recessive genetic disorders result in something that's very harmful. One example is what we see on the screen. Um, this is a cow uh, that has curly calf. Um, so curly calf is a genetic disorder that's unique to Angus cattle and it's a recessive genetic disorder that's present in Angus cattle as a result of extreme inbreeding as as humans have selected for traits um, that they are interested in. If one animal has a trait they like then that animal is widely used and as it turns out some of those animals had this particular harmful gene and so it leads to the early uh, birth uh, of a calf in a um, non-viable um, state, the, the calf dies. And so that's the problem with inbreeding. When inbreeding is gone, when it's alleviated, then you have dominant alleles, like those wolves from outside the population uh, supplied, and those dominant alleles um, trump the recessive alleles and, and prevent those recessive alleles from being expressed. Remember, because of the nature of complete dominance in genetics, as long as one dominant allele is present, then the recessive allele has no impact whatsoever. So small populations are also more susceptible to losing their genetic variability as a result of genetic drift. So on the screen uh, we see, th these are computer models as are often used in ecology, but on the y-axis we see the percenta, percenta of uh, heterozygosity in the population. Heterozygosity is typically measured uh, used as a indication of how many organisms are not uh, inbred. Heterozygosity, of course, is a condition in which you have one dominant allele and one recessive allele. And so you can see that if you have a large population, then uh, that population tends to maintain its diversity. So, for instance, if you start out with a population of 500, you have very little loss of genetic diversity. But if you have a population of 20, as you go through 100 generations, then almost all of that heterozygosity is lost and the population ends up extremely inbred at the end of that time. So the bottom line is this, this relates directly to our discussion of this point of no return. Even if you save just 20 animals, which we did in the case of the condors and we were okay, at least apparently at, at that, in, in that situation, but sometimes if you save just 20 animals then it's just not enough. You give them all that they need but they will lose their genetic variability, become inbred, and, and eventually become extinct as a result of that. One example of that is the heath hen. The heath hen is a bird that's about the size of a small chicken. And heath hens were originally found from Maine to Virginia. Um, but by 1900, heath hens were only found in Martha's Vineyard. There were only 50 hens, as far as we could tell, uh, left by 1907. <clears throat> now the heath hen, obviously, is a refers to the males and females. Interestingly, I'm not sure why we call them 
hens, um, but the heath hen is a species. There was a uh, 2.5 square mile reserve that was established uh, for the birds, and by 1915 there were 2,000 individuals, and so presumably you, know, you would think at that point we've been successful, they're, they're going to make a comeback. But unfortunately, over the next several years, fire, cold winters, predators, and, and, the, um, and disease wiped them out so that in 1927 there's only 14, and then in 1932, the very last one ever seen on the face of the earth was spotted, and they're gone uh, today, as far as we know. And so that's a result of the fact that we hit this point of no return. And when I say that, what I mean is there was not enough genetic variability left in that population to allow the population to persist, um, especially the disease, um, perhaps the cold. <laughs> there was not enough different, there were not enough different genotypes present there to allow this, the population to adapt to changing uh, conditions, especially as it relates to disease. A very uniform um, species genetically uh, tends to have a very hard time with disease. If one disease comes along that's adapted to their genotype, then that species is probably history as a result of that.